Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our, I believe, 18th session on Surah Al Anbiya. And alhamdulillah, we have reached uh, verse number 89. And inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll be examining uh, a few verses uh, tonight. So looking at ayah number 89, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa Zakariya idh nada rabbahu rabbi la tadarni fardan wa anta khayrul warifin. Allah says, and remember Zakariya, and remember Zechariah, when he cried out to his Lord, my Lord, leave me not childless, though you are the best of inheritors. Now, continuing the discussion on the prophets of the past, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a new prophet. And this prophet is Zakaria. Now, Zakaria is, is a prophet that many of us have heard of. And for those of you who might not be familiar with his, uh, his ancestral background, the traditions indicate that, of course, he was one of the prophets of Bani Israel. He was an Israelite. So he's from the progeny of, uh, of Ishaq and Yaqub. But specifically, we find that the his historians note that Zakaria, number one, was from the descendants of Harun. So he was from the descendants of the brother of Musa, from the descendants of Harun. He was also married to a very noble woman, a very righteous woman by the name of Elizabeth. And he was the paternal uncle of Maryam. So Maryam, السلام, the mother of Jesus, السلام, her paternal uncle was Zakaria. So therefore you find that, that uh, the father of Maryam and Zakaria were brothers. So there's a, a family connection there. Now, because Zakaria was from the descendants of Harun, he was considered among the nobles, and he actually belonged to the to the uh, the class of the the priestly class. Meaning, he was considered one of the the high ranking uh, priests in uh, in his community. And therefore, you find that the Quran here mentions that he he prayed for a child. He was he was an elderly man, and he was deeply concerned about the corruption that he saw in the temple. That he saw that many of the the rabbis, many of the clergy, in fact, many of his own relatives were corrupt. And they were waiting for him to die. See, Zakaria was an elderly man. He had, no, he had no heir. And many of his relatives who were religious scholars, they were clerics, he noticed that they had a very, a very concerning lust for power. And they longed for Zakaria to perish so they could employ the priesthood for their own self-interest. So you see, brother, so, so Zakaria alayhi salam, he was the head of the temple. He was the head of the community. And naturally, when you're the head priest, people, they, they give their religious dues to you. They pay their religious dues. And therefore, you find that a lot of the money was controlled by Zakaria. And Zakaria would look after the, the disenfranchised, he would use that money to propagate the message of God. But he has these relatives who are waiting for him to perish. They're waiting for him to die so they can take over that position and they can control the temple. And by controlling the temple, they'll also have access to enormous wealth 
and they 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 would essentially use that money to serve their own desires and their own interests. So Zakaria alayhi salam he he feared for the integrity of God's religion if he dies without an heir. Now it seems that when we look at the Quran because he was an elder, elderly man you know it didn't even occur to him to make dua for a son except after an incident with Maryam now we know that again we don't want to go into details about the story of Maryam but we know that Maryam alayhi salam was a very special young lady she came from a very holy household and she she was dedicated by her mother to serve in the temple and she essentially spent all of her time in the temple and in, in her prayer chamber and all of the rabbis all of the priests they wanted to have the honor of being her guardian because her father had passed away and it was unheard of for a young lady to serve in, uh, in the temple. And the Quran mentions that they drew lots and Zakaria السلام, became her guardian. He was also her paternal uncle. And Allah mentions this. He mentions an incident in ayah number 37 of Surah Ali Imran where Allah says, وَكَفَلَهَا Zakaria." Zakaria took her and he became her guardian, meaning that he would check on her, he would attend to her needs if she needed anything. So she was stationed in her prayer chamber and she was left alone to worship and to, to recite the scriptures. And Zakaria would check in on her every once in a while. In this ayah, it mentions something miraculous about Maryam. Now, this young, pure lady who is in her prayer chamber, the Quran says, وَكَفَّلَهَا زَكَرِيَا كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَا الْمِحْرَابِ وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقَةً The Quran says, whenever Zakaria would go into her prayer chamber, into her, into her mihrab, he would find food with her. And it was not any type of food. It was clearly miraculous because in the winter time, he would enter the prayer chamber of Maryam and he would find summer fruits. In the summertime, when he would enter into her prayer chamber, he would find winter fruits. And this is what prompts him to ask, قَالَ يَا مَرْيَمُ أَنَّا لَكِ هَذَا Oh Maryam, where are you getting this food from? It's not available. These are summer fruits in the winter. These are winter fruits in the summer. It was very unique sustenance that he would find with her. He knew that he had not seen, and he was the only one who had access to her prayer chamber. So he said, I didn't deliver this food to you. And it's not even in season. So where is this coming from? She says to Zakaria that this food is min indillah. It's coming from God. God sustains whoever he wishes without measure. Now, at this moment, when Zakaria saw this, especially when it first happened, he was reminded through Maryam, through Maryam, he was reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's limitless bounty. And therefore, at that moment, Maryam became an inspiration to Zakaria. And the Quran even mentions in ayah number 38. Of Surah Al Imran, Surah 3, ayah number 38, the ayah right after. This, right then and there, as he stood and he saw this miraculous food with Maryam, right then and there, 
he made his dua. What was his dua? Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyiba. Oh God, oh Allah, oh my Lord, grant me a righteous progeny. Write me, grant me a good progeny. Inna kasami'u dua Because you are the hearer of prayers. And therefore you find in Surat Maryam, so in, 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 in the Surat Al-Anbiya, ayah number 89, we get a summarized version, just like in Surat Ali Imran of the dua that he makes, where he says, Rabbi la tadharni faradan, do not leave me childless. Now, you know, Zakaria, he doesn't just want a kid just for the sake of having a child. Even, when, even his children, there's a reason why he wants children. He wants someone to protect the temple, someone to promote and propagate the message of Allah, someone to protect the religion from the corruption of, the, of his relatives. This is the summarized dua that he made. In Surat Maryam, verses 2 to 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a more, the more elaborate, the more detailed version of the dua that he makes. And if you look at the verses, he, he expresses his physical weakness. He says to Allah, he complains to Allah. He says, oh Allah, oh my Lord, my bones have become frail. Inni wahan al minni, my bones are frail. And my head is covered with white hair. It's, it's become engulfed with white hair. So he was very aged. And I have never been wretched in my prayers to you, meaning that you have always responded favorably to my prayers. And then he he expresses his concern. Now, what's beautiful about this dua is that, of course, Allah knows what is what Zakaria fears, but Zakaria he expresses his fear to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this shows you that, you know, part of dua is not to just ask. Sometimes expressing our emotions, expressing our fears, our hopes, our dreams. This is, this is one of the functions of dua, to, to confide in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to speak to him as though you are speaking to a, a lifelong friend. And I am afraid, I, I fear my relatives after me if I pass away. And my wife is, is barren. So he's, he's expressing and he's articulating all of the problems that he has. I'm old, my bones are frail, my head is covered in white hair, I'm worried about the future of my community, I'm worried about my corrupt relatives who will seize the authority and the, the priesthood of the temple. My wife is barren. فَهَبْلِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيَ I don't just want any son. I want a son that is miladunk, that is very close to you. Fahabli. He doesn't say fahabli walada. He doesn't say grant me a son. Grant me from your close proximity. Fahabli miladunka. Miladunka means that I want this child to have an extreme proximity to you. And this wali, this guardian, this individual who will be my child and who will be a guardian, someone who will inherit from Ya'qub and from the family of Ya'qub. So Zakaria wants this child to be an, an inheritor of his knowledge of his prophethood and also his money, you know, because Zechariah's wife is also very wealthy. So if, if they die, they're going to be leaving a lot of money behind. And if, if this, this money falls into the wrong hands, you know, we know that, you know, when people have money and they have no morality, they can wreak havoc 
on a community. And Zakaria's wife was from the descendants of Suleiman, King Suleiman. So, so you see that this is a very pious family, and it's a very, it's it's a very financially uh, well-to-do family. And make him well pleasing to you. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that he answers this dua is also significant. In ayah number 39 of Surah Al Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we go to the, the next verse, ayah number 90, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَى وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ Allah says, so we answered him, meaning we answered his prayer. When he asked Allah that, you know, فَهَبْلِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيَّ Allah says, I answered his dua. I, I will give him, I am going to give him a son who is very close to me. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَوَهَبْنَا And we gave him, and we answered him, and we bestowed John upon him. Yahya. Yahya was the son that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Zakaria. And then Allah says, وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَةً And, we, and we, we set his wife aright. So his wife also was an elderly woman. The narrations mention that when Allah grant, when he made this dua, she began to menstruate again, which, is a, which was a sign that she was able to, uh, to bear children. Now what's interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said to Zakaria that, okay, I grant, I answer your dua, go and marry a young wife. Go marry another woman. But here, what does Allah do? Allah says, your wife, Elizabeth, we will make her able to bear children. Why, why did Allah do this? It's because my dear brothers and sisters, to create someone like Yahya, you have to have this combination of Zakaria and Elizabeth. And this, so even, so th this bloodline is important. And the same way when we were address the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, how do we begin the ziyar of Imam al Hussein? Assalamu alayka ya ibn Rasulullah. Assalamu alayka ya ibn Amir al Mumin. Assalamu alayka ya ibn Fatim. That this you know, there there is a genetic component to this, brothers and sisters. That this bloodline, this, this holy bloodline, is being preserved. You need you need both of these individuals to create someone like Yahya. You need someone who has the spirituality of Elizabeth to create someone like Yahya. Zakaria can't just marry any woman because not any woman is going to give him a child like Yahya. So here when Allah says we set his wife aright, that we gave her the capability to bear children, there's a reason for that. This is not arbitrary. The only way that Yahya can come to this world is that this union has to take place. In the same way, the only way to create someone like Hussein ibn Ali is that you have to have Ali and Fatima. These two lights have to come together. Similarly, the nur of Zakaria and the nur of Elizabeth, they have to come together. That it's the only way for to create someone like, like Yahya. So the, the spiritual mix of these two individuals is necessary for the creation of Yahya. So Allah says, we answered him. Now, how did Allah answer him? It's mentioned again in Surah Ali Imran. See, the, you know, the beauty of the Qur'an is that it's like a puzzle that, you know, you have to cross-reference and, you know, it's you know, reading the Qur'an is an intellectual, it's a very taxing intellectual activity. You know, the Qur'an is not, you know, light reading. It's not like reading a magazine. It's, it's a very rigorous 
activity. So if we go to ayah number 39, Allah mentions the way in which the dua of Zakaria was answered. فَنَادَتْهُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّي فِي الْمِحْرَابِ Imagine the scene. The angels, no, not one angel, Jibra'il and an entourage of angels, they declare to him, they call out to Zakaria. So now, Zakaria is hearing the angelic realm confirming to him the answering of his dua. فَنَادَتْهُ الْمَلَائِكَ Not one, not two, not... The angels call out to him while he was standing in his mihrab. So look at how quickly this dua was answered. وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّ فِي الْمِحْرَابِ And presumably Maryam is still sitting there. That the, when he sees the miraculous food in the mihrab of Maryam, right then and there, هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَا He prayed there, he made the dua there. Allah answered, answered him. What was, the, what was the, the call? What was the message of these angels to Zakaria? So here, the angels say that Allah, we are here to deliver a message to you from God, from Allah. That he gives you the glad tidings of Yahya. So here, we understand from this ayah that Allah named the son of Zakaria. So not only is he giving you this child as a miracle, Allah says, I will also name him. And therefore, you know, there's a Quranic precedent for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to name his chosen servants. So when we hear about Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Prophet, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, it shouldn't be surprising that you know Allah would choose their names because Allah has done it before. If Allah chooses the name for the son of Zakaria, is, is, is it too much for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to select the name of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the granddaughter of the Prophet? So there, there are Quranic precedents for these issues. And then Allah mentions some of the qualities of Yahya. Number one, مُصَدِّقًا بِكَلِمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ That one of the primary roles of Yahya is that he will be confirming a word from God. What does it mean that Yahya will be confirming a word from God? Here, this means that he will confirm the prophethood and the messengerhood of Isa alayhi salam. So he will, he will play a supporting role for Isa ibn Maryam. That because he will be so revered and so respected that anyone who calls Isa alayhi salam a heretic or he's a fraud, Yahya will say, no, he is, he is a messenger of God and I am subservient to him. I am subservient to him. مُصَدِّقًا بِكَلِمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَسَيِّدًا Here, Allah calls him a Sayyid. Now here, Sayyid means someone who's noble, someone who is devout. وَسَيِّدًا وَحَصُورًا حَصُورًا means someone who is chaste. And Zakaria and Yahya alayhi salam, he was among the few prophets who lived a life of total celibacy. Now, just as a side comment regarding this issue of celibacy. Now, celibacy is not a virtue in Islam. Yahya alayhi salam, it seems that he was singularly praised for this trait because it, this chastity, this celibacy resulted from his complete renunciation of the pleasures of this life. He was a zahid in the fullest sense of the word. Now, the reason why this is not, celibacy is not something that Allah wants us to aspire to or, or to try to attain. It's because, you know, nearly all people, you know, uh, 
if they deny themselves carnal pleasures, it's it's inevitably it's inevitably going to lead them to uh, to partake in some type of deviant uh, behavior. So Yahya السلام, was an exception, and there are some fuqaha like Al Muhabbat Al Hilli, the great faqih in Sharia Al Islam, in the section on on marriage, he mentions that it could be that in that Sharia being celibate was mustahab if you know that you're not going to fall into haram if you fear that you might fall into haram then you need to get married so this could be something specific to that sharia at that time or it could be something that only was specific to yahya now in the islamic tradition rasulullah says an nikah sunnati that marriage is my sunnah, it's my way. So in the Islamic tradition, no one should uh, aspire or see celibacy as an Islamic ideal. In the Islamic tradition, this is completely uh, rejected. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants Yahya as as a uh, as a son for Zakaria. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at specifically Imam Al Hussein salam, there is a very unique relationship between Imam Al Hussein and Yahya ibn Zakaria. In fact, the the narrations indicate that when Imam Al Hussein was traveling from Medina to Mecca, from Mecca to Karbala, Imam Zainul Abidin, he says that my father would not stop at any station. Whenever we stopped at any resting area, he would tell us about, he would mention Yahya ibn Zakaria, you know, because they actually had the same fate. Imam Hussein salam, was beheaded. And Yahya was, was beheaded. And this is not a coincidence, my dear brothers and sisters. We have a narration that when Jibra'il taught Zakaria the names of the Ahlul Bayt, specifically the Holy Five members of, of uh, the Ahlul Kisa, when Zakaria heard the name of Hussein, and this is something that Allah has shared with all prophets. Just like Adam السلام, when Zakaria heard the name of Hussein, immediately he felt this surge of sorrow and anguish. And when he asks, why is it that I feel this intense grief when you mention this name, when you mention Hussein? Jibra'il recounts to him, what will happen in the future. And Zakaria begins to cry. And he says, Ilahi, atufja'u khayra jami'i khalqik biwaladi? Oh Allah, are you really going to put the best of your creation through this calamity that he will be tormented through the suffering of his son? Ilahi, atunzilu balwa hadihi raziyya to be fanai? Are you really going to allow this calamity, this tragedy to, to settle at his doorstep? Are you really going to clothe Ali and Fatima with the garment of this tragedy? Bihima, is this tra this misfortune, is this affliction really going to aff afflict them? And then he says, if this is the case, if this is going to happen to the grandson of the Prophet and to the son of Ali and Fatima, if they are going to have to grieve over the beheading of their son, ilahi <inaudible> waladan. So, you know, when Zakaria hears about these, the musibah, the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein, which will happen in the future, 
He retreats in his mihrab and he weeps for three days and he asks Allah Azza wa Jal to give me a son who will have the same fate so I will be a partner in suffering with the Ahlul Bayt. Give me a son who will be the apple of my eye. Even, though, even when I'm at an old age. Try me with my love for my son. And then. Give me a son who will be beloved to me and make him and torment me, make me suffer the same way that you will allow your beloved messenger to suffer. And you see that, that Yahya alayhi salam, he faces the same and the same type of death as Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Now, if we go back to the, the ayah, Ayah number 90, Allah says, And we answered him, and we bestowed John upon him, and we set his wife aright for him. And then Allah mentions three unique qualities about this family. What family? The family of, you know, of Zachariah, Elizabeth, and their son, Yahya. Allah says about them, Innahum, you know, why did Allah give them such an honor? Why did Allah bless them in such a way? Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. Truly they hastened in, good, in doing good deeds. You know, there are some people who vie for power, they vie for money. The family of Zakaria, they used to compete with each other in doing good. They used to rush. They used to hasten to do good. Number one, and I'll, I'll explain each one in a bit more detail. They would hasten towards goodness, towards righteousness. Number two, they called upon us with desire and with fear. Their hearts had fear of God and hope in His mercy. So they were very balanced. And we'll speak about what this means. And they were humble before us. They were people of khushur. Now we look at these three qualities. And if, if we want to be recipients of divine grace, we have to adopt, we have to, you know, build these traits within ourselves. So the first thing that is mentioned is yusari'una fil khayrat. You know, there's a difference between people that do good, between, you know, there might, there might be two people who do good. But what distinguishes them, you know, aside from sincerity? Imagine they have the same level of spirituality. They have the same level of faith. What distingu distinguishes one from the other? Who is the fastest in doing good? Who rushes towards goodness? You know, this is why in, uh, in the Quran, in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, if you recall, Allah on the Day of Judgment, He will put people into three main groups. You know, on the Day of Judgment, you have trillions and trillions of people. All of the people from Adam until the, day of, until the last day, they'll be gathered. How will they be grouped? The Quran mentions that the three main groupings will be Ashabu Shimal, the people of the left hand. These are the wicked people, okay? Ashabu Yameen, right? The people of the right hand. Now, you would think that it should be, it should stop there because we have hell. And we have paradise. So you would think that the day of judgment, there will be two groups. People who will be in Jannah and people who will be in hellfire. Allah says, no. There is a third group. 
وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ The foremost of the foremost. أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ Those who have the highest distinction in the eyes of Allah are those who are the foremost in doing good. You know, even when Allah speaks about prayer, He says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّةٍ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Race, race and rush towards the forgiveness of your Lord. Here, forgiveness of your Lord. Some have said that this is a reference to salah, to prayer. So you might have two people who pray. But one of them hastens to the prayer. One of them prays on time and the other delays. There might be an opportunity to give charity. There might be someone who gives today and someone who will give in a month. The ones who rush, who hasten towards goodness, they have a special rank in the eyes of Allah. That's why we should seize the opportunities to do good. We shouldn't become complacent. There's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says, min fadilat nafs one of the signs of the nobility of the soul is al-musara'atu ila ta'a, is to rush towards acts of obedience. If you want to repent, don't delay it. Rush towards repentance. If you want to give charity, don't delay it. Do it now. Rush to it. If it's the time of salah, rush to the prayer. If you're able to go to hajj, rush to it. Don't delay. So, yusari'una fil khayrat. So, you should be the foremost. You should be the best. There is a, a beautiful narration. It's a beautiful narration, and it's also a narration that really should be, you know, should make us, you know, take pause and reflect. There was a companion of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam by the name of Isa ibn Abdullah al Qummi. He was from Qum, one of the companions of Imam al Sadiq. And Imam al Sadiq tells him something shocking. You know, when I read this hadith, I think to myself that I am really not a Shia of Imam al Sadiq. He says to this man, he says, Ya Isa, Ya Isa ibn Abdullah, Laysa minna wala karama. O Isa, the son of Abdullah, he is not from us, nor does he have any honor. Man kana fi misrin. فيه مئة ألف أو يزيدون وكان في ذلك المصر أحد أورع من الله أكبر إمام الصادق he says أو عيسى he is not from us nor does he have honor the one who lives in a city with a hundred thousand people or more if there is someone that is more pious than him. Imam al-Sadiq is saying that you cannot call yourself our follower, our Shia. If you as a follower of Ahlul Bayt, so if you live in Seattle, or if you know, I live in Vancouver, if you, you live anywhere else in the world, you live in Houston, you live in Sydney, you live in London. Imam al-Sadiq says, if, there, if you live in a city, where there are non-Muslims or there are other Muslims and there are, there are people in your city who are not followers of Ahlul Bayt and who are more pious than you, they are more moral than you, they are more honest than you, they have more integrity than you, you're not one of us. Imam al-Sadiq is saying that if you, are, if you want to as ascribe yourself to us, if you want to associate yourself with us, if you live in a city and there are a hundred thousand people or more, you have to be the most righteous among all of them. You have to have the most integrity among all of them. That if 
this city or this nation took a vote. Who is the most honest person? It should be you. Look how far we as Muslims have gone, how much we have departed from the standard that the Ahlul Bayt have set. You know, I was, I was in a, a city recently that has a, a big Muslim population, a big Muslim population. And I, I had asked about, you know, what are the, you know, we have, there was a conversation about car insurance. You know, how much is car insurance in this zip code, in this area? They said to me, Sheikh, it's one of the highest in the nation. Why? Muslims live here. They says, yes, Sheikh, because of, of uh, insurance fraud. Imagine. Because of the high instances of insurance fraud, the premiums for car insurance are very high in this Muslim majority city. And, and many of them are Shia. Isn't this, isn't this sad? Isn't this pathetic? Imam al-Sadiq says that if you are not from us, unless you are the most pious person in your community, even if there are 100,000 or more, so when, you, when we read this hadith, we have to really ask ourselves, are we, are we meeting this expectation? If the imam were to meet us, would he proudly claim that we are, that we belong to him, that we are part of his community? Or would, would he see us as outsiders, that you are outcasts, you are renegades, you're not, you're not part of the community of Ja'far al-Sadr, you're not one of us, the Ahlul Bayt. The second thing that is mentioned in the ayah about the family of Zakaria is that they call, they used to call upon us with desire and, and with fear. Now, what does this mean? This means, you know, there are some people who are too confident in themselves they say for example that Allah is merciful and Allah he's not going to punish me they feel too safe from God's chastisement and there are those who say oh I've committed so many sins there's no way there's no way out for me I'm doomed for sure I'm going to Jahannam so you know you meet people there are two extremes you have the person who has the holier-than-thou complex, the holier-than-thou attitude, who says, for sure I'm going to Jannah. This is wrong. And then you have someone on the other end of the spectrum who says, I'm evil, I'm messed up, I'm a sinner, I'm a fasiq. For sure I'm going to Jannah. Both of them, both of them are wrong. The family of Zakaria, what makes them very special in the eyes of Allah is that they're balanced. They call, Allah says, they call upon me in desire. They desire my mercy. They're hopeful in my mercy. And they're also fearful of my punishment. You know, there's a beautiful hadith where someone asks Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam about the, the will, the wasiyah of Luqman to his son. It's mentioned in Surah Luqman, Surah number 31, where Luqman gives advice to his son. Now, this is only part of the conversation. This is only part of the wasiyah, part of the advice. The other advice is mentioned in the ahadith. So this man asks Imam al-Sadiq, ma kana fi wasiyati Luqman? What was in the advice, the wasiyah of Luqman to his son? other than what's mentioned in the Qur'an. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, كَانَ فِيهَا الْأَعَجِيب And this is really significant. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, there are wondrous things in the wasiyah of Luqman to his son. It's a treasure. It's really a, a spiritual treasure. And then the Imam says, and you know, for Imam al-Sadiq to say this, I mean, that's significant. Shows you how wise Luqman was. That Imam al-Sadiq says, 
that there are amazing, profound, wondrous spiritual secrets within this wasiyah. And then the Imam, what does he say? And Wallah, brothers and sisters, we're so fortunate that we are followers of Ahlul Bayt, that we have someone like Imam al Sadiq who can tell us. Because other, if it wasn't for Ahlul Bayt, we would have nothing beyond what is mentioned in the Quran. They expound on what is mentioned in the Quran. They give us the detailed accounts. Imam al-Sadiq says, within it are wondrous things. And the Imam says, and the most profound thing that is mentioned in that wasiyah is the following. He mentioned some things, and then I'll just mention one of them. The most wondrous thing, the most profound statement that Luqman made to his son was Luqman, he says to his son, Oh my son, Fear God in such a way that even if you come on the day of judgment with all of the good deeds ever done by human beings and jinn, still think that Allah may punish you because you, it's, it's not good enough. So here, Luqman is instilling fear, the fear of God in the heart of his son. And then what does he say? But look at the balance. And oh my son, hope in God in such a way, be hopeful in God's mercy in such a way that if you were to meet him on the day of judgment, with the sins of all human beings and all jinn, still have hope that he will forgive you. See, this is this is al khawf wal raja. This is what Allah means when He says, Zakaria and his wife and Yahya, this blessed family, they call upon God, hoping in His mercy, but also. They have this fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their hearts. And they were humble before us. They had khushu'. They had khushu'. Khushu', you know, there's a difference between khudu' and khushu'. Khudu' is related to the limbs. Khudur is when the limbs are humble. You know, your hands are to your side. Your head is bowed a little bit. You, you kind of shrink your shoulders in. You humble yourself. You raise your hands like a beggar to your Lord. This is khudur. Someone may appear humble. They may look humble when they stand before God, but in their hearts there is no humility. Khushur is something that is related to the heart. It is the humility that is felt in the heart when the heart perceives the greatness of God. This is khushur. And this is especially important in our prayers. You know, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, and we'll conclude with this, I was hoping to cover the ayah about Sayyidina Maryam, but inshallah, I guess we'll leave that for, for next week. There was just so much to, to cover. When it comes to this issue of khushu', of humbleness and humility, especially in the prayer, there's a narration that says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he once saw a man praying and the man was standing in salah and he was fidgeting and you know some people do this allahu akbar he's adjusting his watch he's seeing if his cell phone is in his pocket 
He's, you know, buttoning his shirt. He's wiping his, just fidgeting, fidgeting. And some of them, mashallah, even playing with his nose, right? He does things in, when he stands before God that he wouldn't even do in front of his children. Fidgeting and moving. The, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he was probably, I mean, you know, when the Prophet stands for prayer, it's, it's like, it's an experience for him. Rasulullah must have been mortified when he saw this guy moving and fidgeting. And so the Prophet, he looked at him and he said to his companions, The Prophet says to his companions that if there was in his heart, if his heart felt the presence of God, if his heart had khushu, his limbs would have also been humbled. That you would have seen the signs of humility on his body, in his, uh, in his limbs. So khushu is how we should stand before God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepts the prayer that has khushu. You know, many people ask, you know, Shaykh, how do I know that my prayers are accepted? You know, when we say accepted, it means that it's pleasing to Allah. You know, you and I, our prayers are correct in the fiqhi sense, meaning that we don't have to make it up. That all we have done is that we have pushed away God's punishment. We've, we've saved ourselves from God's punishment, but we haven't necessarily earned his pleasure. How do we know if our prayers are accepted by God, accepted by Allah? Imam al-Sadiq gives us a litmus test. He says, Man ahabba an ya'lama aqubilat salatuhu am lam tuqbal. Imam al-Sadiq says, if you want to know whether your prayer is accepted and pleasing to Allah or not, فَلْيَنْظُرْ هَلْ مَنَعَتْ the Imam says, look at your prayer. If your prayer is preventing you from indecency and shamelessness, if it's preventing you from sin, then this is a sign that your prayer is accepted. But if you're praying and you're still sinning left and right, then this is a sign that your salah is not maqbul. So to the extent that prayer protects you from sin, that is the extent to which the prayer was accepted. So it goes back to this, this issue of khushu. And prayer will, will only prevent you from sin if, if your heart is in the prayer. If you understand the words and you really you prepare yourself before you even arrive on your musalla, when you perform wudu, you've already done the adhkar of wudu. You recite the adhan, you re recite the iqama, you take your time, you ease your way into the divine presence. Now, uh, inshallah, we will uh, continue with our discussion of ayah number 91 next week uh, inshallah wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin assalamualaikum shaykh alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah um there's this uh, really interesting about what you, what you've been talking about how dua is you have to you're asking you're expressing your fears the hopes and emotions and you're not just asking for something in duas yeah could you elaborate a little bit more on that and how yeah. that kind of interacts with the philosophy of du'as? So, so du'a, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, speaks about uh, du'a, see, there's a difference between calling upon God and asking God for something. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ your Lord, your Rabb, has said to you, call upon me and I will answer you and I will respond. Allah doesn't say, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ إِسْأَلُونِي 
Allah didn't say, ask me. He says, call upon me. Dua is more general than requesting something from God. See, you know, many of us have been conditioned to think that dua is just a vehicle for me to get what I want from God. Meaning it's so I just have a list of wishes. We always think of dua as a request based prayer. I have a number of things that I want and it's very transactional. Oh Allah, give me this, give me that, and give me this. Now there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Allah is generous. You should ask Him. But we should not reduce dua to just a list of things that I want God to give me. Our, our understanding of dua should be deeper than that. Even saying Ya Allah is a dua. Saying Ya Rahman is a dua. You're not asking for anything. Yaqub, when he is separated from his son, he what does he say? Innama ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah. I complain and I complain about my grief and my sorrow to Allah Azza wa He doesn't say that he's asking for anything. He's just complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a virtue. So we have to also get into the habit. You know, sometimes we think that, okay, you know, make dua. I, I, I'm, Allah has given me everything that I want. Dua is not about getting things. Dua is about nurturing your relationship with Allah. You know, in the same way that, you know, you don't only call your friends when you need something from them. Otherwise, you're a bad friend. You know, if I only call Zayn, for example, and maybe I am a bad friend, I don't know. I don't only call Zayn, Brother Zayn, when I need something. So, you know, you're not a good friend if you're only calling when you want something. We should also call upon Allah Azza wa You know, you call your friend because you enjoy talking to them, right? You have friends, you call them because you just enjoy talking to them. What we learned from Anbiya is that they enjoyed talking to Allah. Whether it's them expressing their pain or their sorrow, or them expressing their gratitude, their love, you know, just talking to Allah, putting things in perspective, who I am and who you are. So the Quran has a very, very uh, a beautiful way of presenting this idea of dua. And unfortunately, there's no there's no accurate wor word in the English language that conveys the, the profundity of, of the concept of dua. It's not a prayer, and it's not a, it's not a the word supplication doesn't even do justice to it. Call upon Allah, call upon Ar Rahman. So, a dua could just be something as simple as you invoking one of the names of God. To Allah belongs the most beautiful names. So call him with those names. So if you call upon Allah, that's a dua. If I say, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Wadud, Ya Ghafoor, this is dua. So using dua as, as a way to, uh, to vent, right? I mean, Dua can become a cathartic experience if we if we look at dua as a safe space to release the emotions that I have in my heart, whether they are happy emotions or sad emotions. So, and this is what the prophets of God used to do, that it was their way of confiding in God and a lot, and, and they felt great peace in sharing their most intimate secrets with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their fears and their hopes. And this is, this is what makes their relationship with Allah so strong is because they see him as their most important companion. That he is, he is, he is your companion in your loneliness. Ya anisi fi wahshati, right? That you are my, my intimate friend when I am lonely. So we have to start looking at dua 
from this lens that this is that dua is about developing a deep relationship with Allah where it's not just about you give me this or you give me that. It's about sharing your deepest concerns and your grief with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your pain and your joy, making Allah a part of your life, making him a part of those happy moments and a part of those moments of grief and, and seeing him as your, as your outlet, the ultimate outlet. It's almost like you're uh, turning him into a confidant. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to turn, turn him into a, our confidant because that's, that's his role. This is the meaning of, you know, that, he, that he's Rabbil Alameen. You know, that the fact that he's Rabbil Alameen means that, you know, you might have a confidant who just hears. He, they're just listening, but they can't do anything to help you. Allah is your confidant who is fully capable and has a desire to give you what is best for your dunya and, what, what you, and your akhir. You know, so we, we feel comfort when we talk to a therapist. When, when we have a friend who is just willing to listen, they can't do anything for you, but just the fact that they're listening gives you comfort. Now, how about you have a confidant who is willing to listen and who is all powerful and who knows you better than you know yourself and who has your best interests in mind. This is the best confidant to have. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a follow-up question. Uh, I would like to know the difference between dua and munajat. So this is an excellent question. So, so, so dua comes from the word, you know, da'wah, to call. Munajat is a type of dua. So dua is general, and then you have a subset of dua that we call munajat. Now munajat comes from the word najwa, which means whisper. So one way to think about it is that munajat is something very intimate. Right? It's meant to be recited privately. So, you know, dua, for example, is something more formal. Generally, it's more formal. You know, Allahumma, for example. You see this used in many du'as. Oh, oh Allah, oh my Lord. Whereas Allah, so Allahumma is, is, is basically saying Ya Allah. It's a very formal way of saying Ya Allah. But if you look at munajat, you'll find that in many cases, the word ilahi is used. That my ilah my place of refuge, my God, my Lord. It's much more intimate. If you read the Munajat of Imam Zain al-Abideen, you know, you whisper to someone who's very close to you. You share your, your innermost secrets with the one who's close to you. So Munajat definitely has much more of that, uh, it has that, uh, that intimate feel to it. So if you want to think of, you know, one way of distinguishing between dua and munajat is that, you know, again, dua is general. So munajat are a type of dua, but uh, munajat are much more intimate. And it's, it's better to recite munajat alone. Whereas duas generally can be, can be recited in groups. But munajat is something that's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a more informal communication with Allah. You know, it's kind of like when you have two friends and you're sitting side by side and it's just you and your friend. You can kind of, you, you set aside the formalities and you talk freely. This is munajat, where it's just you and Allah and you can speak freely. Whereas dua has a, has a more formal tone to it. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, there's another question uh, regarding uh, uh, Lady Maryam Salam Allahi uh, uh, history. Mm -hmm. Her mother, uh, Lady Hannah, and um, uh, Prophet Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. uh, and her real name was Aisha, I think. 
and they're both uh, sisters married to two brothers, right? I believe so, yes. Oh. And inshallah, next next week I'll we'll speak uh, in more detail about uh, Maryam and her family so we can get a better idea of, of who Isa alayhi salam is. And inshallah, next week we'll mention that, I mean, it's very interesting when you look at the flow of the surah that Allah has, he's mentioning prophets and then in the middle of the discussion on prophets, Maryam is mentioned. So this, this kind of raises a discussion about, you know, what is she a prophetess? What, why is she mentioned in the discussion on, on prophets? We'll, we'll go into, uh, into details about that. <coughs> Yeah, one question, uh, is the dua of Hazrat Zakaria, is that located in the Quran or is that a hadith that's from somewhere else? So the, the dua of, uh, which dua are you talking about? Now the, the one about Imam al Hussein. The, the one that uh, the Hazrat Yahya have a death similar to Imam Hussein. Yeah, this, this is mentioned in hadith. This is in hadith. It's mentioned in Bihar al Anwar. And... Um, the, this is the question about the word Shahr Ramadan. Uh, is the word Shahr, can it mean full moon and halal mean the crescent? And can Ramadan mean burning wood, which used to occur in the days of the Prophet or in Jahiliyyah after summer solstice? I haven't heard of that. You know, Shahr usually means month. I, I haven't heard that it's used... Uh... To, to indicate another meaning like crescent. And the, the word Ramadan literally means the burning, but the, uh, the hadith from the prophet indicate that it is called Ramadan because the sins of, of the believers are, are burned uh, in, in the month, which is a sign of the mercy of God. I haven't heard anything uh, related to the burning of, of wood. I would need to see a source on that. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, another question. Uh, can we recite duas in Qabul, uh, in Qunut during namaz, apart from the ones that are mentioned in Quran? Yes, so in Qunut, you're free to, re to recite any dua that, uh, that you like. So you can, uh, you can even customize your own dua. You can mention people, family members by name. You have, uh, you have the freedom to recite any type of dua. And, is, and in any language, Sheikh? So it seems, if I recall, uh, the, the fuqaha that I'm familiar with, I believe Sayyid Sistani as well, allows uh, the qunut to be in any language. I would have to double check, but I, mean, I would refer to your marja, but the last time that I, I checked, it seems that at least the contemporary fuqaha allow uh, the dua, the qunut to be in, in the language of your choice. It doesn't have to be in, uh, in Arabic. And, and is it that you have to recite it silently in your heart or is, can it be uh, out loud? It, it, it could be out loud. It could be out loud. But again, it should not be like shouting or anything. But yeah, it, it, it doesn't have to be whispered. It could be out loud. Well, thank you very much, Sheikh. It was a Excellent class, really good thought-provoking points, especially related to namaz and dua. So and thank I'm you very glad, much. I'm glad you guys benefited, inshallah. And we will uh, resume with an interesting discussion on uh, Sayyidah Maryam uh, next week, bi-idhnillah, inshallah. So stay tuned. Inshallah. 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 Inshall